Whatever you walked in today bound with, there is freedom in this house today. You need to reach out and take it today. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, there is freedom. Hallelujah. There is freedom. There is freedom. Oh, yes. There is freedom by his blood. Let's have our own youth convention today. Again, you can sit if you want to, but you won't want to.
It feels good in here this morning. Amen. I'm thankful for the presence of the Lord that is here. And uh, Sister Abbott alluded to, we do have a number that are away for a youth convention this morning. But we got a good youth convention vibe going on in here today. Amen. And we want God's power and presence to be released in this house. This is an important day today. It's Pentecost Sunday. It is the day that we celebrate the initial outpouring of God's Spirit and the birth of the church. Amen. And we are still a part of that movement that began over 2,000 years ago. And so excited to be a part of that. And we're going to celebrate it in the right way. Believe that God's Spirit's going to be poured out here today. We've got at least four that are going to be baptized at the end of this service. So we celebrate for each one of these. Amen. And I believe that God's going to do some spirit baptizing in his house as well today. Amen. That's the way to celebrate it by being able to experience the very same thing that those in Jerusalem at the first Pentecost did. What an exciting thing to be a part of that. Amen. And so thank God. I do want to take a moment to uh, greet some of our visitors here with us this morning. It is great to have uh, Judy, sister Kareen and her husband Bruce here with us from Renfrew today. God bless you. Amen. It's also great to see Diane as well. God bless you, Diane. Amen. It's good to see Alice and her granddaughter Zoe is here with us today. Glad you're here, Zoe. Sister Ellen Watson has her best friend from British Columbia, Suzanne, here today. We're so glad Suzanne's here with us. Amen. It's also great to have Olaide here from Toronto today. God bless you. Glad that you're here with us. We've got Harry's buddy Winston here this morning. Winston, we're glad that you're here with us today. Also great to have Nate here with us, a friend of the Martin family. Glad that he's here with us today. Here to witness Jesse's baptism, and she's one being baptized today, and we're excited for that. Amen. Actually, it's really cool today. Three of those that are being baptized are from Renfrew today. And so it is, the time is right for Renfrew. We're excited about what God is doing in that beautiful community as well. And man, it's also great to have Sam here with, I think with Ryan here this morning. So God bless you both. Amen. And I also want to say it is so great to see Christine and Emmanuel home. And we've been missing them. Amen. They've been in Jamaica for a while. Uh, Christine lost her mother, and but uh, was st- down there for that. But we're so glad that they are back home safely, and uh, thank God for that. And I understand that Stephen and Paulette are traveling back from Jamaica tomorrow. And so, amen. I'm going to be excited to see all of these home, my friends whom I have been missing. Amen. And all of you here in God's house, some of you have been coming for just a few weeks and already you're feeling left out because I'm not calling out your name. But I want you to know we are glad that you are here with us today. 
A few things that I do want to remind you about are our service this evening will take place 6.30 p.m. Come expecting great things from the Lord. Next Sunday night, I'm really excited. One of the things that we have been doing in Renfrew is we've been hearing some of the life testimonies of people whose lives have been transformed. And uh, Brother Justin Young, he uh, shared his a couple of months ago there. And I asked him, and he agreed that next Sunday night, he's going to be sharing his life of, of what God has done and set him free from. Amen. We're excited about that. Something to look forward to next Sunday night. And then a couple of other things uh, we've been mentioning about a chorale for the Singspiration, which the Singspiration is on June the 23rd. But uh, if you want to be a part of that chorale, practices begin this coming Tuesday evening right after our Bible study. And uh, if you are interested in being a part, if you could let Sister Abbott know, she's been sending out the uh, song and the information so people can start to get familiar with that. And so if you want to be a part of that, come and talk to her about it. Also, uh, we have men's breakfast coming up on this Saturday. Men's coffee and ladies' coffee this Saturday at 10 a.m. And so uh, join us for either one of those events. Is coffee at, at the Langell's home. And, uh, and so then also... Uh, we have for the Sunday School Department, they're doing fundraising right now, and so there, uh, there's two phases of that. If you would like to buy some chocolate, Tiffany's got chocolate to hook you up with today, and if you would like to sell chocolate to help out with that, she also has cases of chocolate bars for sale, and so either way, if you can see her after service today, Tiffany, wave your hand, so in case you don't know who Tiffany is, and, and she runs our children's department, and so if you can talk to her about lending a hand with that, that would be appreciated. I also have the possibility of us having our the old asphalt sealed and then across all of the parking lot to have the lines painted coming up this week. But I do, if we're going to proceed with that, I would like to raise a little money to pay for it. It's going to cost about $4,000 to do those things. I'm willing to pledge the first five hundred dollars towards that. And if I could, I'm not necessarily looking for amounts, but if you'll raise your hand over the next month, if you can help out with that and so we can get it done. If I can see that we've got a good support, I'm going to go, go ahead and proceed with that. I we typically have about you know 30 days by the time we get an invoice to pay and so if you can give towards that over this next month I believe that God's going to help us to pay for that and we can get this parking lot finished which would be really really exciting to see and so anyway if you can give towards that and I will don't worry I'll keep reminding you over the next few weeks but so on that end, they would be doing, doing the sealing on Thursday. So that means that the old asphalt would be unavailable on Thursday. And then on Saturday, they would, they would be doing the line striping. So after our men's coffee time, I've told them that we will clear off at that point and they can close off the entrances so they can be uninterrupted in doing their line painting. So that would be this Saturday, just so you know, for uh, extracurricular activities around here that we may need to move them off site. But then we'll be done, and that is fantastic. Amen. One final thing, and that is I've got to sing for a number of birthdays this week. And uh, it just so happens that Esme is off doing her own thing today. Jazlyn is at youth convention, also has a birthday this week. Sean is here, so thank you, Sean, for that. And then uh, Shane is sick this morning and not able to be here, but we're going to sing for Esme, for Jazlyn, for Sean, and for Shane. We wish them all a happy birthday this week. Amen. A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you. May you feel Jesus near every day. best year you've ever had. Let's give them all a hand. And I'll just mention before I leave that the Apostolics, that is our softball team, we are undefeated so far this season. 3-0. and How about that? So thanks to all of you that are supporting this very godly endeavor. Bible says rejoice in the Lord always, so even in, in baseball. So if I've been a little wild for you this morning, we're going to calm down a little bit. But this still talks about the change that God has brought about in our lives.
And it says, when I think about the Lord, the only person who could save you was the Savior. You ever thought about that? We look for salvation in many places, but only God can make that difference. And if you found him this morning, I just want to give thanks to him this morning. We're this morning's tithes and offering. Thank you, Jesus.
We're thankful for the change that you brought around in our lives, God. Lord, nothing else could change us. Nothing else could change our path but you, Lord. And you reached way down. And you picked me up. You turned me around. And now my feet are on solid ground. And I'm so thankful here this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated here this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. The kids can head down to Sunday school this morning. What a beautiful presence of the Lord is here today. And I am so thankful for God's presence and His Spirit that you can feel already. And I know that I can see as I look around, people are experiencing, they are feeling the Spirit of God that is reaching today and touching lives. Amen. And I believe that we are going to have a mighty outpouring of the Holy Ghost and fire here in this place today. And because this is a special baptism day, as I was praying and seeking God about this particular service, I felt Spirit led towards a message about baptism here today because I believe that in this room there are not only those that are already planning to be baptized, but others, I believe, that need to hear the message that will help them to understand the need for and the value of baptism in your life here today. And so I know that Sister Abbott allowed you to sit down. She was just allowing you to have a moment to relax. I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of God's Word. I do want to say Sister Abbott did a great job last Sunday on Mother's Day, and I'm very thankful for the great words she shared with us. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse verses 1 to 4. I love this passage because there's a lot of places where we read references to the gospel. But in this particular passage, we see the message of the gospel spelled out. And so Paul wrote to the Corinthians, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins. Say, he died for my sins. According to the scriptures, and that he was buried. Say, he was buried. And that he rose again. Say, he rose again. The third day, according to the scriptures, the gospel message that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Today I want to preach you on the subject buried and gone. Buried and gone. Let's look to the Lord right now. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you would speak to us here in this place right now. God, I am so thankful for each one of these that have already made up their minds today, Lord. God, to be baptized, to be buried in your name. And I pray, Lord, that your word would come forth with clarity, power, and anointing to help to move us, Lord Jesus. God, I know also today that there are, Lord, a number of people that will be watching this online. God, I don't may not even know that. Them, know where they're at, but I know that your word can speak to them right now. And I pray, Lord, that you would do a work in lives here today. Father, we thank you for it, Lord, and ask that you would help us to respond as we should here today. In Jesus' name, amen. And you can be seated here today. I had a graphic reminder of kind of the basis of this message once again yesterday. One of the responsibilities that I have as a minister of the gospel is that I have very frequently stood by the graveside of someone that has gone on to be with the Lord and helped family members and friends to navigate that process that comes with all that is a part of loss. And yesterday we buried Sister Cook. And, uh, and so I was reminded again in that setting of, of just a lot of things. Because loss is one of the most difficult things for us to cope with in our human experience. And as the church grows, 
It seems like pretty much every week or every couple of weeks there is somebody in the church that is going through having lost a, a loved one, a family member. And, and so it is something that all of us will have to negotiate as a part of this life. It was less than two years ago that I navigated all the complex emotions involved in losing my own father. And so with recent experience, I know how it goes because the mind has to make an adjustment. All of our memories are formed around those shared experiences, those things that we know that person in. There's a context that we share with them. And, uh, you know, in the case of losing a parent, you have all of your childhood memories. And then the more recent members, memories, maybe as an adult. And so your, your previous memory was of a leaving, living, breathing being. And then to make that transition to trying to accept that that person is gone is not something that comes easily. And those sad memories, they tend to uh, pop up or that feeling of loss, just that kind of profound emptiness that comes with realizing they're not there anymore. It will pop up at, at expected times, you know, for example, and losing a father, certainly at Father's Day or around Christmas times that I actually would have a chance to interact with my father in some way. You would expect to feel a sense of loss on those days, but then it's the unexpected times. When you don't expect it, where all of a sudden you just feel this wave of, of loneliness or sadness because of that person passing. And your mind is trying to process the fact that that individual is gone. Some people, they have a hard time even accepting it. They think they still hear the voice of their loved one. They, you know, they walk into a room and they feel like they smell their perfume or their cologne. Or, uh, you know, if everything in, in the moment, their mind kind of forgets they're gone. And everything feels so no normal that they, they call out to that person as if they just stepped out of the room for a moment. Because there's something that's going on in our minds. And there is a healing process that just takes time. So there's a key word that comes uh, when you begin to examine that process, and that word is closure. Closure, by definition, is the act of closing or the state of being closed. It is to bring to an end a conclusion. And we have to process that to where we get an acceptance of that closure that that person is truly gone. For many people, that moment begins at the burial. It is that visual image of the casket being lowered into the ground that has an air of finality about it, and it triggers a very powerful emotional response. And again, I've been at the graveside in many dozens of occasions of, of being with family members, and maybe a person has been fairly stoic until that moment, but very often as in that final moment, the tears begin to flow because something in their mind is being triggered. It is a, a strong emotional response that is very painful Painful in the moment, but it is typically the catalyst for that closure to begin and that acceptance to say, okay, now I know that they're gone. According to World Book Encyclopedia, old school, says that burial is the most common method of disposal in Christian, Jewish, and Muslim countries. Human burial developed from the belief that the dead rise again. Like a seed, according to this belief, a body is planted in the earth to await rebirth. And that certainly is, a, I believe, a very powerfully true statement. And I say that because it is very similar to something that Jesus himself said. In John chapter 12, verse 24, he was speaking in the context of his own upcoming death, burial, and resurrection. But he said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He was referring to the natural process where a seed goes into the ground and that seed does die out to the form that it had before, but only to achieve something much greater, something much more productive and beautiful. So the principle is the same for us. We bury our loved ones in the hope of the resurrection, that laying them in the ground is not the end, but that they will rise in the resurrection, rise to new life once again. I'm not trying to be unnecessarily morbid here today, but I am laying a little bit of a framework for what Scripture uses to make an analogy for baptism here today. 
As Paul explains in the message of the gospel in our text, he emphasizes three key elements of Jesus' life that are at the core of this message. And you repeated them with me as we read our text. Paul emphasizes that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He emphasizes, and that he was buried. And then he says, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, it's that middle one that can seem a little bit inconsequential. The importance of Jesus' death is obvious. The Bible says right here, he died for our sins. Without that price being paid, we are responsible for the cost of our own sin. And that is simply a price that we cannot afford to pay. And so we are so thankful that Jesus was willing to die for us, that he being sinless would take our sin upon himself, that he being innocent would become the guilty on our behalf, and so that we guilty could be declared innocent. So clearly we understand that Jesus dying was important. And clearly also the importance of the resurrection is obvious. For if death wins, and that is the final word, then there is no hope for us. And Paul wrote that if there is no resurrection, then our very faith is in vain, and we are the most pitiable people on earth. If the resurrection did not happen, there is no reason for Christianity, for there is no hope beyond this life. But because Jesus did did rise again, and he was resurrected. We have a hope, a lively hope, a sure hope. The Bible talks again and again about the hope that we have because of Jesus' resurrection. So clearly death and resurrection are incredibly important aspects of the gospel story. But the burial aspect seems less obvious. For one thing, we know it was temporary. Only three days. It seems in many ways just like a transition period between the death and the resurrection and the burial is just kind of the, the holdover stage to get us from the first to the last. But Paul identifies this as being a key component of the gospel. So why is that? Well, let's step back a little bit for a moment because it's very interesting. Part of why we have the Old Testament, the Bible says, is that many of those stories are examples for us. They illustrate deep spiritual truths for us uh, that even though we don't have a tabernacle or a temple and we don't have animal sacrifice, all of those things were pointing ahead to a greater thing in Christ for us. And so if we go back to the plan from the tabernacle, uh, we see a, a few important things. Uh, the first thing was is that as you begin to come to the tabernacle to worship, uh, the very first thing that you would encounter uh, would be an altar. Uh, and on that altar was the place of sacrifice and death. You couldn't approach God without a sacrifice. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Whatever you were there to do became pointless if you did not come with a sacrifice because it is important to recognize that we desperately need what God has to give for us, but those things come at a cost. And there was an important principle going back to the earliest example of humanity in Adam and Eve where something innocent had to die on behalf of the guilty. Uh, Adam and Eve had sinned and their nakedness became apparent. Uh, and so uh, animals had to die from which God made clothing for them. Uh, there was a covering that was made through sacrifice. And it was establishing a precedent that would carry on throughout time. And so there when you approached that place of sacrifice, this was pointing ahead to Jesus' death whereby he would become the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. He would become that sacrifice whose blood was shed to atone for the sins of many. And the Bible teaches us that the death of Jesus, it corresponds to an action on our part, and that is the act of repentance. Repentance is a place where we come to grips uh, with our own sin, uh, with our own need, uh, rather than trying to justify ourselves and all of these little deceits that we wrap around ourselves to try to convince ourselves uh, that we're okay, uh, that we've made good choices, that our life is fine, uh, and people will go through this age of self-delusion, and all of us did. 
Until you reached a place that for some reason of desperation, you came to an acknowledgement. Uh, I can't do this on my own. Uh, I need help. Uh, I'm not a good person. Uh, I'm a sinner. I'm not making good decisions. Uh, I've made bad decisions. Uh, I need a Savior. Uh, and at that moment of self-revelation, uh, we come to a place uh, where we can finally be honest about our own sin uh, and our own failings. Uh, and in that moment of repentance, uh, we confess those sins to God and say, God, I can't do this on my own. I need you. I need your forgiveness. I need help to change. I want to turn away from the sin that I have been walking into, and I want to walk a different direction. I want to walk a different path. I want to be a different man, a different woman. I need things to change in my life. And so repentance is a place where we die to who we used to be. We die out to our sins. We die out to self-rule and this delusion that we are the captain of our own vessel and we can do life and eternity on our own. We die out to that delusion and we decide that we are going to change course and declare Jesus as the Lord of our lives. I'm not Lord, He is. And so that altar of sacrifice was a place that connected people in that first step of coming to God. And repentance is that first step for us. You must have a moment of faith, but then faith should trigger us to a place of repentance. The second thing you encountered was a brazen labor. Even before you got into the actual tabernacle or the temple itself, before you got in, you came to a place of washing. And there, sacrifice is a dirty business. You can't really deal with sin issue without getting a little bit dirty in the process. So when that animal was sacrificed, the blood would splatter and be on the hands of the person coming to seek God, the priest, and he would come next to an altar, and there the filth of death was washed away. The evidence of that ugly sacrifice was removed. This was a closure on the past, the ugliness of death. And only after that would the high priest or the priest move on in to the tabernacle and the place of worship. And so this corresponds to Jesus' burial. The evidence of the cross and its ugliness was buried away. When Jesus rose out of that grave, he was not the one that went into the grave. He was different. He was transformed in every way. Uh, no longer was the evidence of crucifixion all over him. Uh, the power of death was no longer upon him. In fact, death itself uh, had no hold over him. Uh, when Jesus came out of the grave, uh, there was no memory of the cross. Uh, it was gone and it was removed. Uh, that time of death was gone and buried away. Uh, and the Bible says that this corresponds to our baptism today. Uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 3 says, uh, or do you do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Uh, therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Colossians 2.12 says, Buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So the Bible teaches explicitly that our baptism is how we connect to Jesus' burial, uh, where our past is buried and gone, uh, where the man or the woman that we used to be um, is buried and gone, and we say goodbye uh, to an old past. Um, at repentance, uh, we die out to that sin, but at baptism, uh, that sin is buried. Uh, that past is buried and gone. Uh, and so it's to say, uh, I'm no longer going to be that person. Uh, that person is gone. Uh, they're buried. Uh, and the person that will walk out henceforth uh, is a new person uh, in Christ Jesus. And just as Jesus didn't linger in the grave, neither do we linger in the water of baptism. All of you being baptized here today, be thankful for that. I'm not going to hold you under for a long time. 
You don't need to spend minutes down in there for the work to be done, but rather we are buried. But just as Jesus was not ter- permanently buried, neither are we. Because really, this burial is not for us. It is a burial for our sin. The Bible says we rise to walk in newness of life. Our sins are removed. And so we come out of the water a different person than what went into the water. We go in with a sin condition, yet unresolved, but we come out of it with those sins buried and gone. Acts 2 and 38, then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter preached at Pentecost that we are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of of sins. The word remission is interchangeably used with the word forgiveness. And the Greek word that is the root literally means to send away or to remove from. And so when we are baptized, our sins are sent away. They are removed from us. There is the remission or the forgiveness of sin that takes place. I love how David records it. He said in Psalm 103 and 12, he says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. How far are they away? Well, as far as the east is from the west. I like that because if it was as far as the north is from the south, we know how it goes. If you start heading north at some point because of the way our planet works, you go over the pole and you start going south. But because of the way our planet works, uh, you can start going east, uh, and you're always going to be going east. Uh, You never start going west. Uh, As you go around, it's always going east. Uh, And God says, that's how far uh, I'll take your sins away from you. Uh, They are so far gone, they can never be reached. Uh, You can never get to where they were. The prophet Micah recorded it this way, Micah 7, 18. uh, Who is a God like you? pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. Again, Scripture is making a point uh, because on our planet you can climb to the highest peak uh, of the highest mountain. uh, And Mount Everest, uh, you can get really, really high. But the furthest place from us right now uh, on our planet that we can reach theoretically uh, is a place called the Mariana Trench in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, And it is deep enough uh, that you could drop Mount Everest in there uh, and still have more than two kilometers of water uh, over the top of it. Uh, It is such a deep place uh, that uh, when the uh, Micah wrote about this, uh, he was saying God is going to take your sins uh, the furthest place possible from you. Uh, So far that you could never ever reach us. And why would God do that? Micah says because he delights in mercy. It's something that God wants to do. And let me just pause there for a moment right now because there's a lot of people that Satan gets into their heads and starts telling them that God could never love them. That God can never forgive them. God can forgive, you know, ordinary sinners, uh, but he can't forgive you. You know what you've done, uh, and God could never forgive that. Uh, But I want to remind you of a truth from God's word. Uh, The reason why God forgives us uh, is not because of the size or the quantity of our sin, uh, but it's because he delights uh, in mercy. Uh, He does it because he wants to do it. Uh, If you will be obedient uh, and you will respond to his word, uh, it delights him uh, to have the opportunity to forgive your sin. Jesus said repeatedly in parable stories, uh, he says that when one sinner comes to repentance, uh, all of heaven erupts uh, in rejoicing and celebration. Uh, It's not like some kind of, uh, you know, uh, a pity party up there. It's like, oh, no, here's another one that we have to accept into heaven. I really hope that that bozo was going to hell. No. When just one sinner comes to repentance, 
all of heaven begins to celebrate, uh, saying, all right, uh, there's another one uh, that's not lost. Uh, and the Father who delights in mercy uh, is rejoicing uh, because he has another chance uh, to forgive one that he loves uh, and to bring them to himself. The Bible teaches that the whole reason that Jesus shed his blood was so that our sins could be removed from us. Jesus said in Matthew 26 and 28, the event we call the Last Supper, he says, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. There's a couple of things I love there. Uh, first of all, Jesus says it is shed for many. It's not shed for a select few. Uh, it's not God trying to say, all right, uh, I've got a limited number uh, of those that I can forgive. Uh, but rather, his blood was shed uh, for many. Uh, it was shed to where all uh, who wanted to come and drink of the water of life uh, could come and drink of it. Uh, and so he promises, uh, my blood is shed for many. Uh, and then Jesus said, the reason it is shed is to enable the remission of sins. What can happen at baptism happens because Jesus' blood was shed for the remission or the forgiveness of sins. And thus Peter preached at Pentecost uh, that baptism is for the remission of sins. Uh, so what that tells us is that baptism uh, is the meeting point uh, where the blood of Jesus uh, encounters our sin. Uh, and that sin uh, is forever buried and gone, uh, removed as far as the east uh, is from the west. Uh, baptism is the place uh, where sin is obliterated uh, in the blood of Jesus. Revelation 1 and 5, and says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. When baptism takes place, it might be someone like myself who is doing the baptizing, and it's going to take place in water, and it's not holy water. It's water that came out of the tap. It's not even sparkling. But Scripture teaches us that our obedience to this act is unleashing something far greater in the spirit realm. Uh, because in the spirit realm, uh, it's not a pastor uh, that is baptizing someone in the tank or in the river, uh, but rather it is Jesus uh, washing away their sin with his own blood, uh, taking the price that he paid uh, and covering and washing that sin uh, to where it is remitted, uh, it is forgiven, uh, it is removed, uh, it is gone. And how does he wash away our sins? I look like what God said to Paul through Ananias at Paul's conversion. Acts 22 and 16 says, and now why are you waiting? And that's going to come back to haunt you here in a moment because I want to ask the same question. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Ananias said to Paul, what are you doing sitting around here waiting? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord Jesus. It is Jesus who can wash and forgive and make you new. So baptism is where our past is buried and our sin is washed away. We are baptized in water, but that water represents the blood that Jesus shed for us. Our sins are removed from us, and the only thing that could pay the price for them, the blood of Jesus, and God removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. So just like Jesus' burial, there's a lot more going on behind the scenes in the spirit realm than what we can see in the act of baptism alone. It's over in just a few seconds. But in the spirit realm, there is something eternally and forever being changed. In just those few days that Jesus was in the grave, there was far more going on in the spirit realm. Hell was being defeated. Death was being conquered. The very devils themselves were being led like in a Roman triumph where Jesus demonstrated his power and ascendancy over them because he had gone to the cross and laid down his life and conquered conquered sin and death. And something very similar is going on in that moment of baptism 
where our past is being destroyed, our sin is being defeated, and the hold of death is being loosed from us. At baptism, our sins and our sinful past, it's buried and gone. We are washed, we are clean, we are ready to rise again to new life. Jesus arose after his time in the grave in resurrection with the power of eternal life. And the promise is that if we've already read it, Peter said it at Pentecost, that if you will repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins, the promise is is you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. And that is reiterated in Romans chapter 8, which tells us that the same Spirit that caused resurrection, that caused Jesus to rise from the grave, will also work in the lives of those who are filled with God's Spirit. Romans 8 and 11 says, But if the Spirit of Him uh, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, uh, He who raised Christ from the dead uh, will also give life to your mortal bodies uh, through His Spirit that dwells in you. Uh, This is a really amazing scripture uh, because it tells us that at the time of the rapture, uh, that second resurrection, uh, that when that takes place, uh, the Holy Spirit, Spirit within us uh, is going to activate uh, and transform us from mortal uh, to immortality, uh, from corruption uh, to incorruption, uh, to an eternal body like Jesus had. And it's the same Spirit, Scripture says. And God's promise is that if we are obedient in repentance and baptism, that He will fill us with the gift of His Spirit, and with it the promise of the resurrection and eternal life with Him. Let me bring this home. Music, you can get ready to come. You see, God, he never intended for you to drag around the weight of your sins forever. How many of you remember the the classic by Charles Dickens called The Christmas Carol? And the first ghost to visit Ebenezer Scrooge is the ghost of Christmas past. Before that, his old partner comes, and he's a ghost that's all wrapped in chains. And those chains represent all of his sins and flaws and the miserly life that he lived. And Scrooge is haunted by the sound of those chains being dragged around. You may not know it today, but if you have not yet repented and been baptized... You're dragging around chains and a weight that God never intended you to carry. We don't even realize how much we are being crushed by the very weight of our sins. It's pushing us down, bearing us down. And the reason why people are going through life feeling so heavy in their spirit is it is the accumulated weight of their sins that are settled upon them. They don't realize that. But they are being crushed underneath the weight of their own actions and sins. I've baptized hundreds of people at this point. And I always like to ask people after I baptize them, how do you feel? And I have heard very similar responses over the years. And here are some of the most common things that I hear. I hear people say, I feel so light. I feel other people say, I feel like I'm walking on air. Some people will say, I feel so clean, so pure. And what they are expressing is that they didn't even realize before baptism how much weight they were carrying upon them. And when they are baptized and the weight of that sin is taken off their shoulders, they suddenly feel light. They feel like they're walking on air because the weight of sin uh, is no longer crushing them down uh, or dragging them down, but instead uh, they feel that lightness. uh, They feel that joy uh, of being cleaned, uh, of being washed. Uh, The weight has been removed from their shoulders because that sin... It's been forever buried and gone. And the thing is, is that if we'll continue walking in Christ, you keep living with that lightness. 
It's hard for me to remember what it was like. Of course, you know, to be fair, I was five years old when I got baptized, so I didn't necessarily have quite the accumulation of sins at the ripe old age of five that the other people who have had a little more sinning time have done. But there are those of you here today that that isn't your story. You came to God as an adult. You came to God with a lot of weight already on your shoulders. But it's not like you pick that weight back up again at some point because that sin is buried and gone. doesn't mean you'll never sin again. But thankfully, we have repentance. And when we confess our sins, uh, the power of baptism washes us clean. Once again, the blood of Jesus. John put it this way in 1 John 1 and 10, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is a cleansing that continues to take place. And so that weight never accumulates again. I'm going to ask you if you would stand with me right now. And I just want to challenge you to think for a moment here and to answer the question for yourself. Am I carrying an unnecessary weight on my shoulders right now? If I got things that are dragging me down that I don't need to have on my life. Because today, there is forgiveness available. You can come and you can repent of your sins. And if you haven't been baptized in Jesus' name, according to Scripture, you can make that decision. The water is ready. You can be baptized here today. Your sins can be forever buried and gone. And right now, before we come, I want us to pray for a moment. Because I recognize that there are a number of people here today that I could give any kind of invitation and they would come and pray. And they're going to do that here today, this morning. But I want to pray for those of you that are in the valley of decision. And as I have been preaching, you have felt something stir in your heart. But you're also struggling with the fear and the intimidation of acting upon what you feel in your heart. And so I'm going to pray over you right now and pray that God would give you the courage and the boldness to respond to the hunger that's resonating in you right now. In the name of Jesus, God, I pray over my brothers and sisters that are here today, God. Uh, we have heard your word, Lord, and there has been, uh, God, a celebration, Lord, here in this room uh, as we have celebrated the message of the gospel uh, and the fact that you died for us uh, and that there is forgiveness of sins uh, available to us here today, the promise uh, of eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, but I pray, God, for those uh, that this is so new for them uh, and they feel something stirring in their hearts. Uh, but God, they are wrestling, uh, wrestling, Lord, with the decision uh, whether or not to respond right here, right now, God. Uh, but I'm asking in the name of Jesus uh, that a heavenly courage and boldness uh, would flow over them right now, uh, that they would feel, Lord, a greater desperation uh, to get a hold of you uh, than what they would, Lord, to linger in their place and in their comfort zone. Uh, help them, God, to be able to act. Uh, and I'm asking God today uh, that your spirit would be poured Lord, out, Lord, uh, God, that many would have their sins forgiven uh, and new life, Lord, uh, come into their lives through the power of your Spirit. Uh, in Jesus' name, uh, let your work be done right now, oh God, I pray. And on that note, I want to invite you to come and to seek God. Uh, God's going to do a mighty work this Pentecost Sunday. Uh, he's here to pour out His Spirit. Uh, he's here to forgive sin.